And here we go. All right. Welcome to Mark chapter one. Mark, the gospel, the unique gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. We're going to talk some more about that. So let's sing about the Son of God and Son of Man. Beautiful Savior, King of creation, Son of God and Son of Man, truly I love thee, truly I serve thee, light of my soul, my joy, my pray. Yes, praise and thanks, beautiful Savior, Son of God and Son of Man, especially that you have revealed yourself to us, that you have helped us with eyes to see, and therefore we do believe. Continue, Lord, to bless us in our Bible studies, and as we continue to hear and learn more about the uniqueness and the wonders of your word. Lord, thank you for having us attached to you, the true vine, Help us to bear fruit, to continue to grow, to be nourished again this morning as we begin this study of the gospel according to Mark. In the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen. I'm going to use this as the, the, um, the main PowerPoint. Yeah, losing the words. Um, for your studies as well as for these because I want you to understand there's kind of two things, two special things about Mark. Number one is it's a unique gospel. Sometimes people will say, well, I've got a new Christian. Which, which book should I have them read? Read Mark. It's the shortest one. Not a good reason for read Mark. It is the shortest one, all right? It's the shortest gospel. That is true, all right? But, you know, Mark is very, very unique, and I hope after our study, um, at least this morning, if not for the whole study, that you're going to find out how truly unique Mark truly is. And it's all about Jesus. And Derek says, of course it is. All right. Yeah, of course it's about Jesus, but it's about Jesus who is the Christ, the Son of God, and we'll get the Son of Man in there as well. So it's unique. The other thing I want you to understand, this is kind of the big picture here, all right? And turn to Mark 8, would you? Mark, turn to Mark 8, get ready for that. But Mark, the uniqueness of Mark is, you know, a lot of times says seeing is believing. Not true. Seeing is not believing because there's a lot of folks in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that see Jesus, that see the things that Jesus does, but they don't believe. And so Mark is going to help us to see, and we're going to see this over and over and over again, that believing is seeing. So Mark has a unique, so let's start off with a unique gospel, a unique account for us in Mark chapter 8, 22 to 26. Somebody read that for us, would you? And they came to Bethsaida, and some people brought to him a blind man and begged him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. And when he had spit on the earth, on his eyes, and laid his hands on him, he asked him, Do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see, but they are like trees walking. Then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again, and he opened his eyes, and his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. And he sent him to his home, saying, Do not enter the village. Great. There's a couple of things in there, and I just want to do the one for right now. We'll get to it when we get to chapter 8. But what's unique about this healing? No other time. What's unique about this healing? There's a twofold part of this. Yeah, very good. 
What's the matter? Can't Jesus do it right the first time? Well, of course he can. So what's the point? What's the point of this? that the blind man at first spits on his eyes and he sees trees and so on and and then a second time what's the point think of jesus disciples think of us what's the point we don't believe the well we don't see the first time let's say that okay so all right so we don't see the first time do we but we see as jesus continues to work on us and in us and reveal to us The Gospel of Mark is meant to be read circularly. (laughs) What that means is, after you read it once, you turn around and read it a second time because you missed something the first time. And after you read it a second time, you read it a third time because you missed something the second time, and the fourth, and the fifth. When we get to the last verse in Mark, it ends very abruptly. Any of you in the sunrise service, Easter sunrise service? All right, you're the only one to get credit, Greg. All right, but I preached on the last verse of Mark, which is just a strange verse, but I'll save it for later, all right? And so, uh, Greg, you're the only one that knows the answer for that, but that's okay. All right, good. So this is very helpful. Mark is unique and believing is seeing. So far, so good. We're gonna talk about that kind of overall message as we go through here. Now. On your sheet, I gave to you on your sheet that you have there. What I wanted to start off with is Mark who? So let me ask you, was Mark one of the 12? You know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, weren't those part of the 12? You know better. Not Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but Matthew and John were part of the 12. Luke was the physician. So who's this Mark guy? Well, let's look. Mark gives his signature in the gospel of Mark in Mark 14, 51, and 52. Somebody look at that real quickly. We're going to look at each of these passages real quickly, okay? So this is Mark who? Mark 14, 51, and 52. Somebody read that loudly for us, would you please? I remember that from Sunday school because, you know, you know, for a junior high kid, you know, somebody running around naked was a big deal, right? Who is this young man who ran away naked that only is in the gospel according to Mark? Mark, you're right. That's his signature. All right. Now, who else would have known that? Probably only Mark, right? Fascinating. All right. So uh, what an introduction for this poor guy. Okay. Apparently, he had heard about it. You thought it was John who ran away? John Mark. Ah, we'll get to John Mark here in just a little bit. All right? Yes. All right. So here it is. Another one that isn't as obvious. I know that one wasn't obvious. But another one. Look at, you're still in chapter 14. Look at verses 13 to 15. As Jesus gives his disciples some instructions, what do we have here? John, ah, sorry, Mark. Mark 14, 13 to 15. So he sent two of his disciples, telling them, Go to the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Say to the owner of the house who is in it. The teacher asks, Where is my bedroom? Where I may eat the Passover with my disciples. He will show you a large upper room, furnished and ready. Make preparations. You want to guess who the man carrying the jar of water probably was? Tell me John Mark. Probably so. Now, how do we know that? Well, again, who else tells this except for John Mark? All right, so Mark. So again, I think this is a part of his signature. Now, that's interesting. Who always carried the water? The women did, of course. So for a man to be carrying water was kind of an unusual thing, but all right, Mark, John, Mark. What do we know about his mom? Now go to Acts, Acts chapter 12. 
we hear a lot about John Mark, and, and we really get introduced to him more so in the book of Acts. But look here at Acts chapter 12, verse 12, first of all. Those are not English. Well, let's see. King James. Yeah. All right. Okay. All right. You want my phone? I got it on my phone. All right. Anybody got it? X twelve twelve. When he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. So Peter is in prison. He's let out. Uh, angel lets him out, and so on. So where does he go? He goes to the upper room. So far. He goes to the upper room, Mary's house, where they gathered and were praying for him and so on. And thanks, Gretchen. What's his other name? John. There's our John Mark, isn't it? All right. There's our John Mark. Again, so we think that this Mark who writes the gospel is the one who runs away naked, who's carrying the water, whose mom has this large upper room that the disciples are using. Now, Chapter 12, chapter 13, we know about John Mark because when Paul and Barnabas go on their first missionary journey, Barnabas says, hey, let's take along John Mark. And Paul says, you bet, that's great. What's fascinating about it, just to fast forward this and so on, is as they begin, it's Barnabas and Paul and Mark. In chapter 13, we hear it's Paul and Barnabas and Mark. What apparently has happened? Do I need to say it again? Well, okay, yeah, all right, Saul and road to Damascus and so on, but no, this is, this is um, way afterwards, all right? So Paul's on his missionary journey, all right? Barnabas, Paul, and John Mark. Now it's Saul, uh, Paul and Barnabas and John Mark. Who's taken the lead? Paul now has taken the lead. What do you know about Paul? Bold, strong, uh, uh, you know, always speaking what he's saying. What do you know about Barnabas? Quiet, gentle, supporter, and so on. Maybe one of the reasons why John Mark left was maybe Paul was too much for him. <laughs> Paul was maybe just a little bit overpowering. And Paul had been stoned in Antioch, and, and you know Barnabas was looking at this and going, oh, not Barnabas, I'm sorry, John Mark was looking at this saying, oh boy. Anyway, so who's this Mark, John Mark, who's writing the gospel, went on the first missionary journey, but bailed out, went home, came time for the second missionary journey, and Paul and Barnabas say, hey, let's go and visit those folks again, and what is Paul, and Barnabas says, and let's take John Mark with us, and Paul says, no doing because he left the first time he deserted us the first time so god worked great things what happened paul and silas went on a missionary journey and barnabas and john went on a missionary journey don't you wish we had somebody that would tell us about barnabas and john mark what their missionary journey was like luke did for paul and silas wouldn't that be cool when you find it, let me know. I'd like to read it, all right? I don't know that it's written, but fascinating. In Colossians, we have where Paul will talk about that John Mark is the cousin of Barnabas, okay? That's where we find out. So there's this family relationship, okay? And then what's most fascinating and important is what does Peter call Mark in 1 Peter 3, 5.13, it's up on the board. My son, John, Mark, all right? My son, Mark. Well, let's see, Peter was married because he had a mother-in-law, um, so, but what kind of son? Not a biological son, but an adopted son, a spiritual son. You remember how the apostle Paul would call Timothy his son? how the Apostle Paul kind of took Timothy in and, and trained him and so on. All right, so Peter is doing the same thing for this Mark. Sometimes, and maybe you've heard this, 
the gospel according to Mark are the sermons of Peter. Have you heard that? You did now. All right. And we'll be watching this as we go through that Mark's main source of what he wrote, the Holy Spirit, of course, <laughs> but um, his main source is Peter. It's just fascinating when Peter preaches on Pentecost. If, as you look at Peter's outline of his sermon, Mark's outline of the gospel according to Mark. Peter will be quoted a lot in the gospel according to Mark. We'll have Peter's eyewitness account in the gospel according to Mark. We'll talk some more about that. Okay, that's kind of just a lot of introduction stuff, but it's going to be coming up as we go along here, as, as we go through. All right. I'm not going to read it to you because it's on your sheet, but, you know, we even have early church fathers that we have there, Papias and Irenaeus, and uh, we have Jerome, those three, those early church fathers that write to us about, you know, who these people are and so on. You read it yourself, that's fine. But let's get actually into Mark chapter 1. So what's the title of the gospel according to Mark? What's the title? The unique gospel of Jesus Christ. What's the title that's in our Bible? Tell me verse 1 of Mark chapter 1. What does verse 1 say? The beginning, the gospel, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. There are no verbs in that, in the Greek. It is a title, and which is just kind of fascinating, all right? So what can you expect from this gospel according to Mark? It's the beginning, so what can you expect? More to follow, right? There's some pretty interesting stuff coming, all right? It's the beginning of the gospel. What do you expect from the gospel of Mark? Gospel, good news. Who is it about? Jesus, what's his title? The Christ. Maybe some of you with ESV or whatever, does it say Jesus the Messiah? I think some translations have that, and that's good. Jesus the Messiah, who is the Son of God. Mark puts, well, the Holy Spirit has Mark write in this very fascinating way. So as you look at this, so verse 1's the title. Go about to the middle of Mark and who says in Mark 8, 29, you are the Christ? Mark 8, 29. Peter does. Peter does. Jesus is with his disciples. He's way up in Caesarea Philippi, and he asks people, who do people say that I am? Notice what's Mark doing. Right in the middle of the gospel, he's saying, Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ. Got it? At the very end, the centurion sees how he died on the cross, and what does the centurion confess? This man was the son of God. Do you get it? So all of Mark is all about Jesus, who is the Christ, the Messiah, the son of God. And then we fill it in with all kinds of Jesus teachings and things that he does. All right? I want you to get that, that big picture before we actually get started with this, all right? So that's the title that we have. Mark, John Mark, all right, uh, the gospel according to Mark, only quotes the Old Testament once. Matthew quotes it a lot, all right? But Mark quotes it once. Well, kind of twice if we want to count both of these. So verse 2 is, uh, sorry, it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Now, Isaiah was the gospel, uh, sorry, is the gospel of the Old Testament, right? And Isaiah oftentimes is quoted in the New Testament uh, as far as Old Testament prophecy is concerned. Now, John Mark isn't so so terribly concerned. His first quote really comes from Malachi. All right, it's up there on the, on the screen for you there. All right, so I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. That's Malachi 3. Malachi 3 is talking about John the baptizer who would come 
all right, and who would prepare the way for the Messiah who is coming. Malachi, 400 years before Jesus came, and the last time we hear of God speaking through one of his prophets, until John the baptizer. Right, right. So this is just fascinating. So John, Mark, John Mark, all right, Mark, the gospel writer, is picking this up and saying, we haven't heard about God, you know, speaking anything about this for 400 years, but now here we have this, this person who is coming to prepare the way. Now, they would have known the Isaiah passage. Every mountain shall be laid low, every valley filled up, remember, okay? The, the places, the rough places made smooth. Remember that with Isaiah, all right? So sometimes John the baptizer is called, I love this, the bulldozer, John the baptizer. John was a bulldozer. He was strong in his words. He was strong in his life. He was a bulldozer ready to build the highway of the Lord. Just fascinating that way. And so how was he dressed? Verse 4, so John came baptizing in the desert region. Well, that's kind of interesting. We'll talk about that. And preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Whoa, a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Let me continue on. We'll come back here. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were, what? Baptized? Where? In the Jordan River? I know this is all so familiar to you that you don't get it. All right? I want to help you to get it. They were baptized? Unheard of. And in that muddy, old, yucky Jordan River? Oh, no way. I'll show you that in just a little bit. John wore clothing made of camel's hair. Ugh, that wouldn't be too comfortable. And with a leather belt around his waist. Yeah, so what? Well, we'll get it here in just a minute. And he ate locusts and wild honey. Who else wore camel's clothes with a leather belt around his waist who was out in the wilderness? I'll put it up there. Elijah. Elijah. Now, what was Elijah's message? That wasn't a hard question. <laughs> Repent. All of the prophets said that, right? Repent. What's John the baptizer saying? Repent. So John the baptizer comes looking like Elijah. Oh, man, Elijah was dead a long time ago and so on. But he comes and just like Elijah, remember the prophets of Baal? Fire coming down from heaven, all right? Burning up the sacrifice, Elijah, the one who's doing all this stuff, all right? Good. So John the baptizer in kind of the same outfit, <laughs> the image of Elijah is coming, and he's saying a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Well, for the Jews now, all right? Baptism was only for Gentiles. Jews did not need to be baptized, all right? We need to understand that for us to be surprised at what John is doing here. So baptism is already practiced in the Jewish community in the form of ceremonial immersions, but typically it was only among Gentiles who wanted it to become Jews. For a Jew in John's day to submit to baptism was essentially to say, this is why it's a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. I confess that I am as far away from God as a Gentile. How many Jews do you know that would say that? not, right? I thank you, God, that I was not born a Gentile, a woman, or a dog. That was typically what they would say. Sorry, ladies. Sorry, ladies. But, you know, that would be the Jewish men's, you know, kind of a thing that was there, all right? A Gentile. And I need to get right with him. So, what's happening? The real work of the Holy Spirit. Wow. Exciting, all right? through John's preaching the baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Repentance, a baptism of repentance. Now, again, Elijah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, Ezekiel, all right, all the prophets have been talking about this repentance, all right? 
And so what's true repentance? Well, some think that it's, oh, I feel sorry for my sins. What do you know about feelings? You can't trust them. They come and they go and, and all right, they can be strong or they can be weak, whatever it is, all right? So, all right, feeling, that's not true repentance, all right? It is good to feel sorry for your sins, all right? It, it, it is good to, to know that and have that. But repentance is an action. Repentance is. Jesus told us to make a change in our mind, not merely to feel sorry for what we have done, but a change of direction, a change of direction. Uh, you know what? I forgot to put that slide in. That's okay. So this change of direction, I'm headed away from God, turn me around and bring me back into that. It, it describes something that we must do before we come to God. No, no one can repent unless the Holy Spirit works in their hearts first. Okay. Martin Luther, small catechism, third article. I believe that I cannot believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord, or come to him, but the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel. And the right, you got it, right? Right. And so the same thing with repentance. The message of law has to come out. Repent and be baptized, every one of you. But the only way that they'll do it is for the Holy Spirit to be working in their hearts. So there's this silly explanation. If you were in New York and I tell you to come to Los Angeles, I don't really need to say, now leave New York and come to Los Angeles, all right? To come to Los Angeles is to leave New York. And if I haven't left New York, I certainly can't come to Los Angeles, all right? So we can't come into the kingdom of God unless, first of all, we leave our life of sin. And we can't do it on our own. I believe I cannot by my own reason or strength, right? And so that's this whole thing. So what's repentance? It's the work of God in a person's life. It's not trying harder. It's not, you know, doing these certain things or whatever it is. But it is God working through his word that he speaks here. All right. So here we got John, who is um, clothed in camel's hair and, and a belt, leather belt around his neck, uh, neck, his waist, <laughs> not his neck. Um, <laughs> yes. uh, and then preaching this baptism of repentance. Jesus tells them that Elijah has come. Again, notice where this is? Middle of Mark. All right. So again, what's the gospel according to Mark doing? He had starts us off with John the baptizer is like that Elijah who was calling people to repentance. In the middle of the book, just in case we forgot chapter one, we get in chapter nine, that Elijah has come, meaning John the baptizer who prepared the way for Jesus. Okay? Pastor? Yes. I was going to say a good example of someone who felt sorry for their sins but was not repentant was Judas because uh, uh, repentance means to turn back to God. And it is, like you said, a work of the Holy Spirit. Judas felt very sorry for what he did, but he wasn't repentant in that he didn't come back to Jesus. That is exactly and, right. And so, he so Judas is a good example. Anne was just saying, all right, so since you didn't hear, that Judas is a good example of feeling sorry for your sins, but not truly repenting, not truly coming back to Jesus. Yeah, Peter and, and, and Judas, both of them. Yeah, thanks, Anne. Good, good. John continues on then, all right? And so who is this? This is the Elijah who has come, who's the bulldozer preparing the way for the Lord, who says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in, in the name of Jesus Christ. We'll talk about John's baptism a little bit. But then what else does John say? After me, so verse 7, and this was his message. After me will come one more powerful than I. Boy, John the baptizer, pretty powerful. Elijah, pretty powerful, right? The thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. What is that all about? Well, we go to our Jewish roots a little bit and understand that this Jewish idea 
John said this because, John Mark, I'm sorry, John the baptizer said this because in his day, the rabbis taught that a teacher could require their students to do just about anything except take off their sandals, okay? You, you know, as you're a teacher, you couldn't ask them to take off your sandals. That was considered to be too much. But John said he wasn't even worthy to take off Jesus' sandals. Do you understand what John is saying? This is the rabbi of rabbis. This is the teacher of teachers. I am so low, I'm not even worth doing what I'm not supposed to have to do, but I'm not even worth, all right, you get it. And so one of the rabbinical Talmuds, all right, which would be the Jewish ideas that were there, all services which a slave does for his master, um, for his master, a pupil should do for his teacher, all right? So what a slave does, a pupil should do for his teacher, except untying his shoes. That, that, was, that was in their inner law. You understand what John is saying? Boy, he is coming and saying, I am absolutely nothing. Jesus is all. What a great prophet. What a great man as he comes here. All right? So John the baptizer. John's baptism. Let me talk to you real quickly about that because, you know, in the book of Acts, there are two examples. There was Apollos. Remember Aquila Priscilla, you know, found this young man that was uh, teaching about Jesus and so on, but he only knew the baptism of John. And so they baptized him. And you scratch your head and you go, huh? I didn't think there was rebaptism. There isn't. But what had happened? Apollos had not heard fully about Jesus Christ yet. And so he had been baptized in a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, which was a preparation for the coming of Jesus. And so Aquila and Priscilla met together with Apollos, explained the scriptures to him, especially Jesus, and then he was baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, or as the book of Acts will say, in the name of Jesus. Okay? So Apollos was not rebaptized, he was just baptized in the name of Jesus, even though he had had the baptism of John. Now, if it was just once, all right, that'd be plenty, but it's twice. Also in Acts chapter 19, you can look it up later on, but in Acts chapter 19, we have these men of Ephesus as Paul's going on his missionary journey and so on, and he's talking with them and says, you know, do you know this Holy Spirit? Do you know Jesus? No, we haven't heard of him. Well, how is it that you're Christians? Well, we were baptized into John's baptism. Oh, so they taught them more about these men of Ephesus more about Jesus and explain that to them and then baptize them in the name of Jesus. All right? So this baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Claire? When, when John baptized, he was not using the word grace like you do. Correct. When John was baptizing, he did not say, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. He was baptizing for a repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now, what words he used, I don't know, because the Bible doesn't tell us. But it was a different baptism from the Trinitarian baptism that we do today. Right. Right. Okay? Thank you. Acts 18, 24 and 25. All right. Thank you very much. I will try and change that. Not right now. All right. Thanks. Very good. All right. And so we have this, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So he continues on, verse 8. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Now, our Pentecostal friends, God bless them all, our Pentecostal friends understand that as a different baptism from water baptism. What they will do is they will separate it and talk about water baptism and then later on a baptism of the Holy Spirit. Most of the time talking about speaking in tongues, doing miracles, doing, you know, some kind of a spiritual gifts kind of a thing. The Apostle Paul picks up big time on that in 1 Corinthians and says, no, no, no. That is not what spiritual gifts is all about. And that's not what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is coming to faith through 
I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So with my Pentecostal friends, I have a lot of fun when they say, have you been baptized by the Holy Spirit? I says, yep, August 8th, 1954. That was my baptism. They get to figuring it up and going, uh, I says, you're right, it's my water baptism. That was my baptism. And I was baptized in the Holy Spirit at that time. It's not a special speaking in tongues or whatever it might be, all right? But I wanted to share that with you because they'll use this verse as this different kind of baptism. So there was a baptism of John of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, and then there's a baptism of the Trinitarian Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that Jesus gives. Now, how do we know that? Because in Romans chapter 6, what does it talk about? So this baptism that Jesus told his disciples after his death and resurrection, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins? No, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. So why would Jesus give that commission then? He had died and rose again. And what happens in baptism? The old sinful nature drowns and dies, and a new man daily comes forth and arise. Don't you know that all of us have been baptized into Christ, have been baptized into his death, Romans 6, right? And so here we've got all of this baptism of John prior to, preparation to, this Trinitarian baptism. So after Jesus died and rose again and ascended and, and gave the Great Commission, there was no longer any need for John's baptism because it was a baptism in preparation of Jesus coming. Okay? All right, let's keep going. So we got John, all right, the baptizer. So we've got him here. At that time, Jesus came from where? Nazareth, can anything good come? All right, you remember that? All right, just keep that in mind. And was... Jesus is baptized? What do you know about that? All right, we'll talk about that in a minute. By John, and where did he get baptized? Yuck! In the Jordan. All right, so we've got that. Oh, wait a minute. Okay, keep all that in mind. I got to come back to it. I got to tell you something much more important first. In verse 10, we have a most important phrase. Sorry, I should have looked ahead. Chi uthus. Easy to say, all right? Kai uthus. What it means is immediately or just then, or my favorite is, and you know what happened next? And you know what happened next? And you know what happened next? This is a favorite phrase of John Mark. This is a favorite phrase. We're going to hear it 40 times. You're going to get tired of me. But I'm going to try and help you to see it each time. There are five times just in today's 20 verses where we see it. And I'll show it to you here in just a little bit. But it punctuates things. It's just like a little kid, you know? Little child comes in and says, well, how was your morning? Oh, it was just great. We played with Play-Doh and then we went outside and then we flew kites and then we rode bikes and then we got a snack and then we went back outside and then my friend did this and that, 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 that. right? You know about that? You know, the excitement of a little child, that's Kai Uthas. All right, that's Mark's excitement about writing this. Now, translators try and write it so that it runs smoothly, okay? What's interesting is in the Greek of Mark chapter 1, 35 out of the 45 verses all begin with chi, not chi uthis, all right, but and. And so you're reading there, and this happened, 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 and this happened. How many times? 35 out of 45. Now, how boring would that be to read that? So, unfortunately, it's not literally translated for us. But the point I wanted you to make, uh, that I wanted to make for you is, and you know what happened next? There's this real excitement in the Gospel of Mark. And it's one of the unique things about it. So in chapter 1, that's why I'm sorry I had a backtrack on verse 10 here. Verse 10, and you know what happened next? 
verse 12. And you know what happened next? Verse 18, verse 20, verse 23, verse 29. All of these begin with Caiuthas. Okay? And what's fascinating is Mark just like a, like a, a machine gun almost. <laughs> You know, keeps telling you all this stuff that happens that's there. And he's all excited about it. So we're going to have a lot more times in there. What I do in my Bible is I put um, either Uthus or Kai Uthus or something next to each of these verses because how does your verse 10 start? Somebody read. What, what does verse 10 start off with? And straightway. Not too bad. How does it start? And when he, oh, brother, okay. And when he came up, just as, all right, sure. Weak. So understand it. And you know what happened next? I mean, he is really excited about it. So we'll look at that each time. So, all right. So you know what happened next? Jesus was coming out of the water and he saw the heaven being torn open. All right. So um, let me do that. Let's see. I got to come back. Nope. Nope. Yep. That's what I want to do. Okay. All right. He saw heaven being torn open and the spirit of God descending. The heavens torn open? What's that all about? That's that's pretty you know what happened next. Have you ever seen a hurricane or a tornado or you know something like that coming? It's that's pretty amazing. Can you imagine the heavens being torn open? Mark, unique. I'll try and help you. Mark uniquely will use the same term for the heavens being torn open at Jesus' baptism for what being torn from top to bottom at the end. The curtain and the temple was torn, same word, same message that's there. So at Jesus' baptism, heaven is torn open and we see who Jesus is, Jesus Christ the son of God, who comes from heaven, right? And at Jesus' death, what has Jesus' death done? Opened up our direct access to God the Father. You don't have to go through the temple anymore, and the curtain no longer separates, and so on. Unique to Mark, all right? Fascinating, these little pieces that are there. And so the heavens were torn asunder. They were rent asunder, all right? And he saw them, and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. The Jewish rabbis would go all the way back to Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness over the face of the deep, and the Spirit was hovering over the face of the deep. Hovering. Kind of sounds like a bird. Kind of sounds like a dove. So what did the rabbis do? They talked about the spirit over the waters and so on being symbolized as a dove. So it's way back at the beginning of Genesis that they have that, okay? Isn't it wonderful that God, with that kind of understanding that they had at Jesus' baptism, would physically show the presence of the Holy Spirit by a dove? And what it talks about here is this dove coming down and staying with Jesus, all right? And so we have the dove who comes and stays with Jesus. It'll be interesting later on. So the spirit, the breath, the Holy Spirit comes to Jesus at his baptism. And on the cross, he cries out with a loud voice, it is finished and he gives up his spirit. Yes, yes. Again, bookends for us. All right? So at the baptism, we have this visible sign that, of course, we already know Jesus is son of God with the Father and the Holy Spirit and so on. But as true man, now he has this, and then his spirit, all right, dies. Uh, sorry, his body dies, and he willingly gives up the spirit at his death bookends again okay i'm gonna keep going there's just a lot and you know what happened next here we go and a voice came from heaven now i already told you how many years has it been since they heard the voice of god from malachi 400 years 
So again, as John Mark is writing this and as it's happening, and you know what happened next? We heard God's voice. We haven't heard it for 400 years. You get it? And this is great. And what does the voice from heaven say? This is my beloved son, who is Jesus, the son of God. How do you know? Because the father told us. Now, middle of Mark, again, middle of Mark, we have the transfiguration. And in the transfiguration, what does God the father say again? Same thing. You're right. The same thing. And so Mark, John Mark, the gospel of Mark wants us to know who is Jesus. He's the Messiah, the Christ, the promised one. John the baptizer came and prepared the way for him. And, and he's the fulfillment of all of this there. And he is the son of God who the father has been promising all along here. And so we get it here once again. Then the centurion at the end, we already talked about that. So it begins with the baptism of Jesus. Now we have the transfiguration. And then we have a Gentile centurion of all people who say, this truly was the son of God. All right. So one, two, three times that are there. Good. All right. And you know what happened next? <coughs> Verse 12. Verse 12. And you know what happened next? The spirit drove him out into the desert. Oh, my. Immediately, Kai Uthas. All right. You know what happened next? Mark has used this strange word that the spirit drove him out into the desert. Now, it's going to be the same word that Mark is going to use later on in chapter one. It's next time's lesson because I won't get there. But it's next time's lesson where when Jesus drives out the demons, it's the same word that's there. Why could Jesus, true man, please understand, drive out demons? Because he was also true God, because the spirit of God was in him, baptism wise, and so on. And so how fascinating, again, unique to Mark, how the spirit drove him into the desert. And now Jesus will drive out the demons with that same power, his power. Please understand me, right? All right. But the Holy Spirit who's there. All right. Again, very unique to Mark. We'll look at these. I'll mention it to you again next time as far, far as verses 34 and 39 as he does that. All right. So we've got that. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth and Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Um, all right. And so we've got all of these different things. Um, I talked about Nazareth and Galilee and baptized. All right. Yeah. So um, a voice came from heaven. You are my son whom I love. With you, I'm well pleased. Verse 12, at once the spirit drove him into the desert. I'm way behind myself here. Verse 13, and he was in the desert. You say, of course, 40 days. Everything in the Bible is 40 days, right? Well, there's a lot of things in there for 40 days. But again, think back with me on the significance of the number 40, but especially 40 days. What do you about know about Noah and 40 days? It rained 40 days and 40 nights, right? Okay. What do you know about Moses in 40 days? He was on top of Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights, getting all the instructions that God had given him and so on, right? What do you know about Israel in the wilderness? 40 years in the wilderness. All right. So Jesus is driven by the Spirit into the wilderness for 40 days because Jesus is Israel reduced to one. Jesus is the perfect Israel. Israel was called the son of God in the Old Testament. Remember Pharaoh? Remember Joseph? Um, sorry, Moses comes to Joseph. Yes, Moses comes to Joseph and he says, let my people go, my son, you know, and, and he talks to Pharaoh about that. And Pharaoh goes, no, no, no. What happened to Pharaoh's firstborn son because he wouldn't let God's son go? You get it? Jesus is the new Israel 
the Son of God. And we've got it even with his temptation that he is in the wilderness 40 days and 40 nights without food, as well as Israel having to be in the wilderness for punishment for their sins, Jesus being tempted in us. Elijah, when he runs away, remember how Jezebel threatened his life all right after the um, the fire coming down from heaven, so on. Jezebel threatened his life, and he runs for 40 days on the strength. Remember the angel food that he ate? I always like to call it angel food, all right? That Elijah's running, and he goes down behind the blue, uh, fall, um, rests under the, the broom tree, and the angel comes, you know, and wakes him up and gives him this food to eat. You know, you need this because it's going to go, you're going to have to go for a long time, and feeds him the, the angel food is what I call it. Um, and then he was sustained on that food for 40 days as he goes down to Sinai. You remember that whole story of Elijah? All right, it's another 40 that's there. So Jesus is in the desert, of course, 40 days. Well, maybe not, of course, but you get all the impact of this as unique, not Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all tell us 40 days, but kind of the uniqueness of that. All right, so what does Mark tell us? And so we have, and was in the desert 40 days being tempted by Satan. How many temptations? What does Mark tell us? Say it again. 40 days worth. Thank you. Good answer. Good answer, Andrew. Yeah. All right. What's the point here? Was Jesus just tempted three times? We know about those three, not from Mark, but from Matthew and Luke, all right? What's Mark's point? He was tempted for 40 days, all right? Actually, he continually was tempted. And why is that important? Hebrews chapter 4. We don't have a high priest that, that is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, we can come to the throne of grace and receive mercy and grace. You know? You know that passage from Hebrews? So important here. So Mark, very uniquely, doesn't tell us of the three temptations, specific temptations, although Matthew and Luke do. Thank you, Matthew and Luke. There's whole teachings with those three uh, temptations that Jesus had, but these continual temptations that are there, okay? Mark's unique, isn't he? Mark is unique, all right? And he was with the wild animals. Huh? Why does Mark tell us that? That's very unique to Mark. Only Mark tells us that. So what's the deal with being, whoops, all right, I gotta show you. Oh, I'm way behind, sorry. All right, you gotta tell me you can't see. I can see it right here. I just, all right, here we go. All right, so he was with the wild beasts. What's fascinating about that is the big deal is that he was with them, but they did not harm him. Why didn't they harm him? Just like in the garden before the fall into sin. Yeah. So Jesus who is the Christ, who is the Son of God, who is tempted in every way as we are, is the new Adam who has power and authority, and the devil has no power over him. The wild animals have no power over him. He is the new Adam. Get it? This is only Mark. Mark tells us this. Very fascinating. All right, Jesus remains the unfallen, sinless one despite of all the temptation, with authority also over the wild beasts. And not only the wild beasts, all right, and you know what else? The angels, there you got it. He was with the wild animals, didn't hurt him, and the angels attended him. The angels. When's the first time we hear about angels? Genesis, right? And what do you know about angels? They were guarding the tree of life. They kept the Adam and Eve from coming back and eating of the tree of life. Now the angels are coming and ministering to Jesus, who is 
the tree of life, if you would, who is the one who, who is life. You get that part of it. And the other thing is, what did God promise Moses and the children of Israel as they are coming out of um, Egypt and down to Mount Sinai and into the promised land? He will send his angel to go before you, to guard you, to guide you, and so on. Jesus greater than Moses. Jesus is the one who's there. And what are the angels doing? Ministering to Jesus. I should have put up here the Hebrews passage. You know that one? What are angels? Ministering spirits sent forth to serve those who have been called. Your guardian angel. You've been talk, told about that, right? You know, what's the angel's job? To guard us in all our ways. All right? Yeah, it's the psalm that's there too. You get it? So again, Mark gives us this little bitty thing here. And you know what happened next? We've got, he was tempted for 40 days being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals and they didn't hurt him. And the angels attended him. All right. Wow. Big stuff. All right? So let's keep going. So we've got this baptism of Jesus. Oh, by the way, why did Jesus have to be baptized? To fulfill all righteousness. Thank you very much. What does that mean? You don't know. All right. That's just what the Bible says. <laughs> all right. All right. To fulfill all righteousness. What's righteousness? Being right with God. What's the only way we can be right with God? Tell me, Jesus. And so why did Jesus have to be baptized? To fulfill all righteousness so that his righteousness might become our righteousness and our sin might become, yeah, got it. Yeah, got it. Right, right. And so here we've got to fulfill all righteousness. Good answer. And it's because his righteousness is ours through his suffering, death, resurrection, and his baptism was this beginning of the public ministry as John Mark helps us with it. All right? Good to fulfill the law, to fulfill the punishment of the law, certainly. Sin had to be condemned. Sin had to be punished. So Jesus goes through that baptism. Yeah. Yeah. He also went through the baptism of fire later on with Garden of Gethsemane and so on, as, as we can talk about that. All right, good. So why does Jesus come? Verse 14. After John was put in prison, now this is a whole interesting thing too, and we'll get to it later on. Mark is just going to tell us John the baptizer's in prison. In Mark chapter 6, he's going to explain it to us how he got in there. All right. And again, this is just a John Mark thing. All right. This is a Mark thing. We'll talk about it later on. But here, who's his focus on? John the baptizer? No, his focus is on Jesus, who is the Christ, who is the Son of God. So let's get John in, in prison. <laughs> All right. So he's not the main character. Jesus is. And so what does Jesus do? Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, title. Jesus comes proclaiming the good news of God. Jesus is a preacher who does miracles, not a miracle worker who preaches. What do people a lot of times like? The flashy, the big stuff, right? I want you to catch my attention. I want you to do things that really catch my attention. But Jesus came to preach. And of course, he preached like no one else did. But all right, his main emphasis, he was a preacher who did wonderful miracles. Again, Mark's gospel, um, the gospel according to Mark, is going to really emphasize the teachings of Jesus. We'll have some miracles that are there, but he's really going to be talking about the teachings of Jesus. So what's the message, the first message that Jesus is preaching about the good news? The time has come. Let me just talk to you about that for a little bit. This is also a very important, there's two Greek words for time. And maybe you've seen this before, all right? Kronos and Kairos, okay? Kronos time is watch time. 
All right, it's time I have to watch because I need to get ready for, oh, and there goes my time. All right, well, speaking of Cronus time, all right, um, let me turn that silly thing off. All right, well, I'm sorry, we run out of Cronus time. We have not run out of Kairos time. Let's start next time with Kairos time. And you know what happened next? And you know what happened next? Kairos time, all right? I'm sorry, all right, so we gotta stop there. Let me pray and then we'll, kind of um, get ready for next week. Oh, Lord and Savior Jesus, how exciting it is to read and study your word. How wonderful it is that you give to us this unique gospel of Mark and that you give to us all of these insights and understandings to know who you are and how precious that you are. Continue to bless us and lead us and guide us. Uh, uh, Shower us with the Holy Spirit as you do your disciples and help us as we share that message with others. In the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen. All right, so let me stop sharing and stop recording.